we're going to tell you a story, okay? Once upon a time, there was a man who had a dream. His name was John Glenn. Not the John Glenn that flew around the world, or around the earth uh, 50 years ago. He had a dream too, of course. But our John Glenn was a farm boy back in the 1920s, growing up in the hills of western Pennsylvania in a little town called Slippery Rock. He and his uh, three older brothers attended a rural school and got into the usual scrapes and, and uh, daredevil things that kids did. His daughter says that uh, once he walked around the top of the silo out near the barn. <laughs> Had great faith at that time. As a young man, John went on to college, to first to Worcester in Ohio, and later to uh, McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago, where in 1946, he earned his degree in theology. John received a call from Pleasant Ridge Presbyterian Church in Cincinnati to serve as associate minister, and that is where his dream began. It is said that an associate minister does little preaching, but a lot of reaching. Reaching out into a community, visiting members of a congregation, and ministering to their spiritual needs as individuals. Too often, I was saddened by finding the older retired persons miserably lonely and isolated from the mainstream of life humiliated because of sharply lowered income or embarrassingly dependent to some extent on sometimes reluctant children. Their plight became a haunted, ob haunting obsession and I prayed often that some door would open so that I could minister more effectively to those neglected elderly. A few years later, John was called to the pulpit of the Boulevard Presbyterian Church in Cincinnati, or in Columbus. He discovered that many folks, even younger ones, worried about the plight of the elderly people. I felt strongly that this, per, uh, this problem was the church's business. It was a very special opportunity for ministry that the church was giving lip service, but doing very little acting. Oh, the government could help, and it did. But I felt deeply that the church could do the job with much more concern and care and compassion and more economically than the government. I'm going to fall off this thing. Then in June 1961, John Glenn spotted a notice in the Columbus Dispatch that the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, would be auctioning off Bristol Homes, a subdivision in Pike County. John lost no time in driving to the little town of Waverly, 60 miles south of Columbus, to have a look. He saw 325 unoccupied, neglected houses. But he also saw the beginning of his dream coming true. John Glenn imagined tree-lined streets with cozy homes, green lawns, and blooming flowers. He saw a haven where older folk could live its secure, independent, enjoyed an active lifestyle, and a neighborly fellowship. But why were these 325 homes sitting there idle, uncared for in the first place. We must go back a bit, 10 years earlier in 1952. In 1952, that year, the Atomic Energy Commission was examining possible sites for a giant gaseous diffusion plant. Ohio's Governor Lauschi and congressional representatives launched their efforts to have the plant located in southeast Ohio, possibly in Pike County. 
Then, in August 1952, the headlines announced the news, Pike County to get atomic plant. Workers from out of state arrived. Housing was needed for 4,000 anticipated employees. Over the next three years, development sprang up, providing 875 new homes in the area. Bristol Homes, at the east end of Waverly, was among them. But as the atomic plant grew, with new and improved operating efficiency, those 4,000 employees were no longer needed. By spring 51, the workforce had diminished to 1,800. Families began pulling out. Most of Bristol homes were left empty, and many had not even been ever occupied. John Glenn checked out the abandoned homes and the surrounding town of Columbus. To his enthusiasm, spread rapidly among the Brist his friends at, Brist at the Boulevard Presbyterian Church, from there to neighboring congregations in Chillicothe, Portsmouth, and also Waverly. Encouraged by a positive response and then armed with general financial support uh, from individuals, churches, uh, businesses, John Glenn and J.B. Wilson uh, representing Pike County uh, Chamber of Commerce, traveled to Washington, D.C. with the uh, required $5,000 in earnest money. John and J.B. offered the winning bid, $680,000. The Cleveland Plain Dealer stated this was $250,000 more than the next highest bid, a fact that caused a good Scottish Presbyterian like John to wince. The Waverly News carried this story. Church group acquires Bristol homes, and that's why we're here. Perhaps a, 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 some, some general interest is the fact that the next highest bid came from the, the infamous Jimmy Hoffa. Oh. <laughs> Only days after the Federal Housing Authority awarded Bristol homes to those Southern Ohio Presbyterians, Ohio Church Residences was officially registered as a nonprofit organist, uh, corporation. The meeting at Waverly High School was well received. Mayor William Fleck gave a warm welcome from the community, expressing great pleasure that Bristol Village would be sponsored by Ohio Church Residences, an organization with religious values reflecting those of the Pike community, Pike County community. Guidelines were discussed at length, and John Glenn assured the audience that the applicants were to be, one, financially stable, two, in reasonably good health, and three affiliated with a church of any denomination. He added that the Federal Housing Authority and Ohio Church Residences had already anticipated a need for an activity center, and it would be larger than required in order to accommodate social events and activities with our neighbors in Pike County. The land on which the activity center was built was donated by the Waverly Business Association. Our relationship with the community at large was cemented. With the open house only a few weeks away, there was a flurry of activity. Trustees and their wives appeared almost daily, getting the two open houses at 200 and 202 Wendy Lane ready for showing. They were refurbished, redecorated, 
and tastefully furnished. The third house was also ready, but was left unfurnished so visitors could visualize how they might decorate. The grounds were tended, shrubs trimmed, trash removed. More than 2,000 people flooded the village on opening day, October the 15th, 1961. They came from all over, as far away as Massachusetts. Some applied for residency immediately. Another red letter day, at a meeting held in Waverly, Ohio church residents, representatives, federal housing authority officials, and John Glenn signed the deed. Papers were finalized and an FHA loan to cover two major debts, $250,000 for the rehabilitation of the village and $250,000 to construct an activity center. In August 1962, John Glenn accepted the full-time position as executive director. Bristol Village, the first of its kind in the United States, was off and running. Moving right along, it wasn't long before some of those pioneer dreams became reality. Groundbreaking for the activity center came in June of 1964. The land was donated by the Waverly Business Association when the village was only two years old. Worker bees lost no time moving supplies and equipment from the temporary workshops on 5th Street into the new activity center. In short order, the building was a beehive of activity. The annual report showed 49 different activities with volunteer directors running the show at the activity center. By 1965, all the homes had been leased, and there was an 18-month to two-year waiting period. The Junior Chamber of Commerce, with the cooperation of the City of Waverly, had installed new down-low street signs throughout the village. Meanwhile, news of the success of Ohio's church residences experiment in retirement living was spreading beyond Ohio. The Board of Directors explored some of the programs in other states and began moving from a local to a national scope. And in 1967, Ohio church residences became national church residences. Well, the office at 111 was bursting at the seams. This problem was solved by closing in a carport and adding a roof between 111 and 109. In May of 1977, First National Bank opened a branch office in the lobby of our activity center. Carol Givens and Joanne Plunk served their customers well in those early years, and in 1997, our Kathy Snodgrass took over as our bank branch manager. She's still there today, greeting her village clients with that winning smile. But what about those apartments that the pioneers envisioned for that time when yard maintenance would be less appealing? In May of 1977, the first apartments at Bristol Court were ready for occupancy. With 20 units available, 19 residents moved in immediately. A month later, the dining room at the court opened with a seating capacity of 60. Louise Howard, who had supervised the snack bar in the center, took over as coordinator. They began serving meals twice a day to residents throughout the village with two seatings needed for each meal. Expansion envisioned by those pioneers was underway by mid-80s. Much of it was made possible by the foundation through two ambitious capital campaigns. The first was Project Renaissance. Over $700,000 was raised and the long-awaited nursing home convalescent center 
was built on the west side of the campus. When it was dedicated in the spring of 1989, it was the first continuous care facility in a retirement community in the United States. Two months later, the William E. Blaine Fitness Center was dedicated. This included the heated five-lane indoor pool and spa. Bill Blaine, Columbus attorney and chairman of NCR's Board of Trustees, was a generous contributor and a driving force behind the addition. A bronze plaque on the walking track just outside the pool honors his service to the community. A second capital campaign, Project 2000, was launched in November of 1991. Included in the plan would be a large wing added to the activity center, a stage, a rehearsal room, an enlarged library and cafe. The campaign kicked off with a gala celebration. Ben Lane and Fran Horton shared the overall campaign. Betty Benefield and her twin sister, Annabeth Bates, hosted the gala, <clears throat> the gala party with Master of Ceremonies, Mildred Vitz. A highlight of the evening was the unveiling of the Money Tree poster that would record the progress of the campaign. A contribution of $10,000 came from the First National Bank, presented, by, presented to Van Ambrose by the bank president, Bob Foster. In April of 1992, groundbreaking ceremonies were held in front of the activity center. And by Christmas that year, the new stage, along with the sight and sound booth and a rehearsal room, were unveiled at the annual chorale concert, with Ben Lane and Fran Horton sharing the ceremonial ribbon cutting. During this same period, 20 apartments were added at Bristol Court. A sprinkler system was installed, and the dining room was expanded to seat 72 people. Parking space was also enlarged, and pavement poured, connecting the apartments to the activity center. In the spring of 1995, groundbreaking took place for the White Elephant, our major source of arts and crafts income and expansion of the wood shop took place. Among those manning the shovels were Hunter and Roseanne Severding for the elephant and Jim Stone, chairman of the wood shop. With the first phase of Project 2000 completed, the second phase began. Bristol, Pavilion, Bristol Pavilion's assisted living wing was dedicated in 1994. At the Convalescent Center, the Eden Project was introduced, first with fish aquariums and then with a charming aviary of small chirping birds. It wasn't long before patients were enjoying visits from well-mannered four-legged pets. Groundbreaking for the memory loss unit, the gardens, took place in the fall of 1999. Anita Cooper, whose mother, May Cooper, was a resident of the nursing home, was a major force in designing and planning the gardens. Welcome to the new century. Retirees in the 90s came looking for more modern housing. They wanted homes with two bathrooms, patios, sunrooms, garages, and more storage space. 7th Street was extended and the open look was in. The village was about to get a facelift. Homes on 5th Street suddenly sprouted peaks. Remember that? <laughs> Much to the dismay of some traditional residents. Then there was more major surgery when some of the original 1950s homes were taken down and replaced with new models. Across from the activity center, a string of welcome inns appeared on the knoll. 
The woman's cottage and the men's cue and cushion were remodeled along the same strip. A new, much larger administration building at 605th Avenue opened in June 2001. New young trees were planted on tree lawns and bulbs and flowers were added. Time to bloom as the seasons changed. The watchtower caused, <laughs> caused a whole lot of head scratching among the older and wiser folks, but when it was finally completed, Pavilion on the Green fit nicely into the newly landscaped entrance and the canal theme along Route 335 and throughout the campus. The canal boat was made by Cy Whitfield. A new wing was added to the activity center. The Terrace Cafe was seating for 75 and right next to it our beautiful, spacious library. From the very beginning, the library was essential for our retired citizens. 50 years ago, Alan McIntosh opened the doors of the first library at 701 Fifth Street. He installed the shelving, cataloged dozens of books, donated by newcomers, who even back then overestimated the amount of shelf space in the new retirement home. He established the hours, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., six days a week. When the activity center was built two years later, everything was moved to the new location, where the computer room is now. Then during construction for Project 2000, the library had to be moved temporarily to 221 Robin Road, where Philip Carnes lives now. However, business continued as usual under the capable leadership of librarian Margaret Boss and her team of dependable volunteers. Margaret has, Margaret has volunteered in our library for over 20 years. She will be greatly missed as Margaret and Walter move to their new home in Oregon. We wish them contentment and happiness as they move closer to family. The day finally came when all those thousands of books had to once again be carefully packed, labeled, and transported to their new home. A plaque on the library wall honors the memory of Harry Hostrasser, who supervised the entire operation. Bristol Village Library is among the largest retirement community libraries in the United States. Active seniors from way back have known the importance of exercise, diet, and health care. The medical building next door to the activity center was dedicated in 1971. Red Cross courses were set up by the residents. Health fairs became an annual tradition. Monthly blood pressure clinics were visited by many residents. In the 80s, we added transportation for the handicapped. The convalescent center was built in 1989. Assisted Living Pavilion opened in 1994. Bristol Gardens Memory Loss Unit in 1999. And in 2005, these three divisions of health care were renamed and placed under one umbrella, Traditions at Bristol Village. Did you know, going back a few years in our history, there was a large cornfield behind the houses on Oak and Cardinal? Folks have fond memories of a corn roast that took place in the 80s. Everybody brought lawn chairs, helped shuck the corn, and then enjoyed the feast that followed. Jay Early from his roof. <laughs> Today, villagers sign up early for the limited garden plots, and by midsummer, a table is set up just outside the nook, and it's help yourself time to a 
juicy tomato or a cucumber, zucchini is almost inevitably plentiful. <laughs> and this giant sweet potato, harvested by Jerry Barnes, was not up for grabs. Special interest groups spring up from time to time, and because of efforts of people who've been spearheaded these projects, our campus has been greatly enriched. Mary Cooper's Wildflower Woods was dedicated in 2006. Tranquility Park, with its winding, paved walking paths, was Tom Anderson's pet project. He and his committee put many hours into what is one of the loveliest areas <laughs> in our village. And not long after that, the labyrinth, a very ancient spiritual aid, was dedicated on September 11th, 2009, in memory of Fred Mickelson, who had served on the committee. Spearheaded by Otto Zing, the circular walking path for spiritual communion is believed to be the first retirement community labyrinth in the nation. Other 21st century additions include the new tennis court, the improved shuffleboard area, a playground for those visiting grandchildren, and to the delight of our four-legged friends, a fenced-in dog park, complete with water fountain and benches for proud owners, but no fire plugs. Proceeds from the sale of Lake White's Governor's Lodge had been set aside to help maintain a buffer zone for the village, a priority of National Church residences earlier year, years earlier. Through the combined efforts of the city of Waverly and Bristol Village, it was able to purchase acreage from the Armbruster farmland. Bristol Park, on the east edge of the campus, is a safe, clean family recreation area with security maintained by Waverly Law Enforcement, with ample parking, and trash receptacles that are regularly maintained. <laughs> the flagship of National Church Residences is sailing into its sixth decade. We have stayed the course. No longer an experiment in retirement living, but rather the number one leader of the fleet, where mature citizens embark on a voyage that will expand their horizons well beyond the, beyond the golden years. But it's the people, a rainbow of movers and shakers, who offer their friendship and encouragement as we set sail on that mystery cruise called retirement, and I bid you bon voyage! <laughs>